On December 10th, 2020, the world's first cloned endangered species native to North America was born. Elizabeth Ann, now an adorable black-footed ferret, was cloned using cell lines that have been crowd preserved for over three decades. This birth is a milestone for conservation, bringing in unique genetic variation into an endangered species population. It's also the culmination of seven and a half years of work a collaboration with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Viagen, the cloning and advanced reproductive technology partner, the San Diego Zoo Global that banked and crowd preserved these cell lines for three decades, the association of zoos and aquarium that have helped with captive breeding for the population for decades, and of course, with Revive and Restore as a project manager and a catalyst for this incredible genetic rescue. There's no one better to give some historical context to the Blackfooted Ferret than Pete Gober from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Blackfooted Ferret Recovery Team, who's dedicated much of his life to preserving and protecting this endangered species. Grasslands of the American West are one of the most impacted wildlife habitats on the whole continent. If you think about grasslands stretching from Canada to Mexico and from the Intermountain West back east of the Missouri River, you had a very, very large area. Within that area, there were about 100 million acres, or 20% of that total, that were covered by prairie dogs at one time or another. Prairie dogs provided a lot of protein, moving the sun's energy through plants to all kinds of predators across that area. Black-footed ferrets were just one of those predators. They preyed on prairie dogs. There were probably tens of thousands of them at one time. But they were reduced by three things that really impacted the grasslands. One was farming in the eastern part of the range. Later on, there was a livestock industry that developed all through that area and a good deal of prairie dog control, eliminating prairie dogs because of potential competition with domestic livestock. And finally, the advent of an invasive disease, sylvatic plague. One last colony of ferrets was found in northwestern Wyoming around 1980. The population prospered for a few years and then plague hit. And at that point in time, the Wyoming Game and Fish Department, who had been following the population carefully along with the Fish and Wildlife Service, pulled those animals back into captivity to start a captive breeding program. And the last 18 animals from that population were pulled into captive breeding facilities. Only seven of those individuals were considered founders with a unique genetic variation. So all the black-footed ferrets that we're working with and all these captive breeding facilities across the country, they all descended from just a handful of animals. Black-footed ferrets were on the brink of extinction and we thought they were gone. And then a small population was discovered in Wyoming and it was an electrifying finding. They're not extinct. And the question became like, well, how many are there? Where are they located? And I followed that information avidly. One of the key people that saved black-footed ferrets was a Wyoming veterinarian named Tom Thorne. And he and I were both at a conservation society meeting about the time that they were gonna be bringing black-footed ferrets into captivity. Because of my work with the frozen zoo, one thing I knew for sure is if anybody put their hands on one of these ferrets, they should take a skin sample so that we could establish a cell culture. That was before cloning, but I knew that it would help in the effort to recover black-footed ferrets. I came back to California and one day a box arrived in the lab from Wyoming and I went, whoa, what is this? I opened it up and it was skin biopsies from black-footed ferrets. And the team in the frozen zoo cultured those. They didn't all grow, but they cultured them and two cell cultures from two different individuals were successfully saved. And then it turns out that those two individuals are not represented in the captive population. So they become a very valuable resource to new sources of genetic variation. And one of those was a female named Willa. In 2013, I received a call somewhat out of the blue from someone named Seth Willie. He introduced himself as working with endangered species at U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and he'd heard about our work bridging conservation and biotechnology, and he asked me pointedly, what could we do to help with the black-footed ferret? Well, the first thing we learned was that the black-footed ferret, which had been successfully bred for decades at the National Black-Footed Ferret Center, had 
over the years, over 9,000 kids were born, but that most of them were either cousins or siblings. They were so closely related. The first thing we did was to start to probe both a better understanding of the research behind this, the resources that were available. And Ben Novak, our lead scientist, took on the quest to figure out how we could actually create a genetic rescue program. As Revive and Restore's lead scientist, the task fell to me to start researching how we might help the black-footed ferret. For populations in which individuals are so closely related, the long-term recovery can be complicated by the risk of the extinction vortex. The San Diego frozen zoo has cell lines from ferrets that have no living descendants. And so by cloning from those cell lines, we can start the road of genetic rescue leading to outbreeding, undoing the effects of inbreeding, and ultimately leading to an increasing population that becomes stable, improving the chances of the long-term recovery for this species. For the black-footed ferret, in which every living individual is related to each other at the level of siblings and first cousins, the only place to go to get new genetic diversity is the past. We wanted to build our genetic rescue plan on genomic insight and no one had sequenced black-footed ferret genomes before. So we took the opportunity to sequence Willa's genome and compare it to individuals that had been born in recent generations. And the incredible result was actually that Willa has as much as three times more genetic diversity than living ferrets. And that was the real discovery that said, we should clone this ferret. The next step was to go through the permitting process. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service required us to go through a public comment period. This was the first time this had been done for the cloning of an endangered species. We were amazed and delighted when we received the approval for that permit. And the next step was for us to get the world's best cloning partner involved, and that was Biogen Pets and Equine. We've been working with this technology now for more than 20 years. The technology comes from back licensing from the Roslyn Institute from the cloning of Dolly the Sheep. But over the last 25 years, Biogen's invested a tremendous amount of time, energy, and money in perfecting and developing this technology. We have to remember, even though it's 25-year-old technology to us, um, it's still brand new technology to a lot of people. And therefore, it takes a little warming up for them to be comfortable moving forward with something that they see as so novel. Working with the interspecies work is just very complicated because you never know until you try it whether or not it's actually going to work. For initial studies, we start with looking at blastocyst development. So we test whether or not the domestic ferret oocyte can reprogram a black but a ferret cell into a blastocyst. And so that was our initial first check. And once we did that, we did some early pregnancy work. And so we actually took and made some embryos with black-footed ferret cells into domestic oocytes, and they were transferred into domestic recipients. And we found that we have uh, pregnancies. And from there, once the pregnancies went on, we knew that once we had a willow born, that we had a successful pregnancy and that it would work. It's been a lot of work, um, staying up a lot of nights and, and checking out our clone and um, all the journey that it's taken to get here. But um, considering we have a closed population with no, no other means of introducing new genetics uh, into our population, I think the, the benefit of engaging in this cloning project is going to be very well worth the effort. The whole center was in some way involved with the arrival of these clones. It was the first day she had opened one eye. They don't always open eyes together. So she had just cracked open one, one eye, one way and taken her first view of the world. And she had been previous to that very timid with her litter mates. She often was on the bottom of the feeding pile and we were kind of worried she was getting pushed around and maybe her litter mates were outweighing her. The day her eyes opened, I opened this nest box and she is just chewing on her siblings. She's pushing them out of the way. She's tussling. She like nabbing hamster carcasses away from them. And the difference in her personality was just so exciting. And I was like, there you are. You are a vibrant little black-footed ferret. You've just been hiding. The demonstration of this advanced reproductive technology bodes well for the black-footed ferret and possibly for helping other endangered species now and into the future. And that includes the Chevalsky's horse as well as the Northern White Rhino. Recovering species like the black-footed ferret requires us to consider new and emerging technologies. And then we add these goods to our conservation food books. So when we think about 
bring species back. When we think about a cloning strategy, we have to really think about it holistically about what are we trying to achieve. It's not about just bringing back one animal. It can never be about bringing back one animal. It has to be about bringing back the entire species so that it can thrive successfully on its own without further human intervention. That really comes down to making sure that you've got enough diverse cell lines to allow that to happen. Elizabeth Ann is a first successful clone black-footed ferret, but she won't be the last. Already we are cloning more from Willis cell line with the idea to help increase the population and bring in with those offspring unique genetic variation. It is the effect of having an eighth new founder for the population. While there are other threats that the black-footed ferret population faces from habitat fragmentation to sylvatic plague, this is an incredibly powerful milestone, not just for the black-footed ferret, but also for other endangered species. Our prowess as a species has led us to astounding accomplishments, and it's also impacted the natural world in ways that now threaten the existence of so many species. I hope that our use of these powerful technologies can kind of redress some of the damages that we have done and awaken us to the possibilities of restoring nature in beyond what we imagined possible. If you conserve black-footed ferrets, you're going to be required to conserve prairie dogs, and by extension, you're going to conserve a lot of other species, from ferruginous hawks to golden eagles to mountain plovers to burrowing owls to badgers to a whole host of different species. The black-footed ferret has lived on this planet for half a million years. Our goal with this project is to ensure its survival for the next half a million years. To do so, we will have to help increase its resilience to sylvatic plague. And that is our next biggest challenge. Stay tuned to hear more about our research.